Okay, so in, in last lesson, in the last two lessons really, there hasn't been that much content, so much as just summarizing what was going on in the book. If you really want to know know what's going on more, I, I suggest um, a few things. First off, read the Old Testament for yourself. Um, the idea that there's nothing in there for us today is just wrong. It just comes from a lack of understanding how it applies. But just because you don't understand how something applies doesn't mean that you should just ignore it. Another is because this study is based off of this book, I would highly recommend you get this book. I talked about it in the beginning. It's called Encountering the Old Testament. It's by Arnold and Bayer. Okay? Um, it, it really will elaborate a lot more on the things that I just briefly touched on. Um, and um, it, it just, it's just all around. It, it, it's, a good, it's a good book to have as, as a survey of the Old Testament of what's, what's going on. Um, and it also goes a lot more in depth on some stuff, but it doesn't have all the stuff that I've talked about, so there is that. Um, okay. As far as um, as where we're picking up now, we, we went through Genesis, Job, uh, Exodus, Leviticus, uh, Numbers, and now that takes us to this question, how many were there? Um, I personally am of the view that, that it was a mistranslation, that there were not 600,000 men alone, because that would mean that there were over 2 million people. Um, and there's a few things to know with that. First up, Egypt's armies at the time were only 20,000 strong. If there were 600,000 men alone of that age, of fighting age, then why didn't they just defeat Egypt? Why were they submitting to that? Um, another thing, um, some would still be crossing the sea while others were in Canaan. There would have been too long of a line of people, especially in some of the areas where they've got like ravines and stuff. It just kind of begs why. Why would that be a thing? Um, now remember, sometimes you know people say, oh, there's no mark of the land and there's no this with the higher numbers, and we misunderstand and say, okay, so they're trying to say that the Bible is not true. I'm not saying that the Bible is not true. What we're saying is that there's probably a misunderstanding with how many were actually there. Um, uh, also, they would have strongly outnumbered Egypt uh, and Canaan. I already mentioned about Egypt, but Canaan. Um, the land could not have supported them, so there would have had to be uh, divine. There would have to be a miracle there. Now, obviously, some people will say, oh, well, it was a miracle God provided. Well, yes, but saying that there was a miracle when there wasn't a miracle doesn't make God any more mighty. doesn't make God any more... Uh, accurate or whatever. It just makes you less reliable as a source. Does that make sense? I hope that you're not you're understanding what I'm saying. Uh, sticking to bias doesn't get us anywhere. Um, also, it would have left a mark on the land of Goshen if there were that many. Um, why there would have been a mark? Um, even even with the the huts and all that, it just it would have left a too huge of a mark. So. Um, once again, the Genesis happens mostly over there, a little bit over here, but mostly over here. Um, Exodus happens uh, whoop, to there. Leviticus happens here. Numbers happens from here to here, and then probably to right around here somewhere. And Deuteronomy happens while they're over here waiting. Um, so uh, they were all probably written together, though, towards the end of Moses' life, and then maybe edited later, probably edited later and maybe edited it even again, and then copied. I already talked about this in one of the introduction letters, so I really don't want to get too much into it. So Deuteronomy is the second law, the uh, the reestablishment, if you will, that you know this is a new generation, and God is reestablishing the law. He's you know uh, giving them some final things before they go into the land. Um, we see in 28.15 that the blessings are related to submission. In fact, I'll, I'll even say that. I'll, I mean, I'll even read that. 28.15 says... Um, but it shall come about if you do not obey the Lord your God, to observe to do all his commandments and his, and, uh, his statutes with which I charge you today, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. So once again, um, blessings are related to submission to the Lord. Um, we also see from Deuteronomy a very cool outline. Love of the Lord plus fear of the Lord equals a healthy relationship with the Lord, which leads us to obedience of the Lord. Okay. Love of the Lord plus fear of the Lord equals a healthy relationship with the Lord, which causes us to be obedient. Okay, So, um, Deuteronomy is, is, is the bridge book. It bridges from law to history. Uh, between you know the end of Numbers and the beginning of Joshua, it just works as a nice connector between those two. Um, 
<clears throat> it was meant to be read every seven years, um, which obviously was not done as it should have been. Um, it also has uh, prophecy in it about it prophesies about the rebellion, about the exile, prophesies about uh, Jesus. It's interesting to note all these things in Deuteronomy that God knew what was going to happen when the people were in Israel, um, and He gave them a warning. And that's in, in seven, chapter 7. I'm not going to read that, but it basically says, if you do this, this is what's going to happen. This is what's going to happen after that. But if you turn back, then this, and all that. Um, so De Deuteronomy has a little bit of a chiastic structure. You can see here, um, 1 through 3 is a look backwards. 31 through 34, uh, 34 is a look forwards. Uh, there's a covenant summary in 4 through 11 and in chapter 27 through 30. And then here in the middle, there's covenant stipulations. This will happen if this happens in chapters 12 through 26. Um, so the so the more, the main thrust of, of Deuteronomy is obviously the covenant stipulations. Do good so that God can bless you. Obviously, he wants to is is, is another point there. Um, so then uh, it, it can also be broken up into a series of three speeches. The first speech being a recounting from uh, the uh, you know what's happened and that kind of stuff in chapters one through four forty three, the second speech stage uh, speech would be a restatement of the law in four forty four through twenty six nineteen, and the third speech would be farewell in the appendixes in chapters twenty seven through thirty one where Moses has a song, Moses dies, that kind of stuff. Um, now it was probably uh, oh, I'm sorry that that ends that ends uh, um, Deuteronomy. Sorry, I was pushing the wrong way. So that, that brings us to Joshua, the book of Joshua, I should say. Now, it was probably written by Joshua. Um, he appears multiple times uh, in Exodus 7, 8 through 14. Um, well, I should turn there to make sure I'm quoting the right spot. In one of these places, um, he was the one who stayed in the tabernacle when, when Abraham, or I'm sorry, Moses left. Um um, okay, in 17, 8 through 14, he's he's the one who leads the battle, leads the Israelite army against Am uh, Amalek. In 24, 13, uh, he's the one who goes with Moses up the mountain. In chapter 33 through 11, he is the one who. Um, Um, who stays in the tabernacle while Moses leaves to give um, to give the words? I'm sorry, not in the tabernacle. He stayed there with God. Um, I don't know if this is with. The, it doesn't look like this is with the tabernacle. It looks like this is with on the mountaintop. Um, and then he's also mentioned in Numbers 13:8. He's one of the. He's one of the um, one of the um, spies, and he is one of the two that gives a good report. Um, so we see a little bit of a play on words throughout Scripture. Uh, Jesus is is uh, an English um, translation for a word Jesus, which is um, Greek, which comes from uh, Yeshua or Joshua, whatever you want to say that. Um, so in essence, Jesus and Joshua is pretty much the exact same name. Um, the, I mean, obviously not the exact same name, but you get the idea of what I'm saying. Um, and so Joshua becomes a symbol for Christ uh, and the work that he would do in the future and that he led the people into the promised land. Jesus leads us into the uh, promised land, which is obviously heaven. Um, and then also Joshua is, is another key, key person in uh, um, Ezra. And he's actually the priest in Ezra. Uh, who 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 leads with the people into um, back into the the promised land after the exile? But we'll get to that later. Um, now the conquest took about um, seven years or so. The events of Joshua happen over a period of about twenty years. Um, we see in 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 chapter two um, a prostitute by the name of Rahab who preserves some of the um, some of the spies. The, the second set. Of, there's a new set of spies that are set out, set out in the book of Joshua, and she um, keeps them safe. Um, 
and uh, um, as a result, she she becomes part of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Her her and her family are preserved. Um, now it's interesting to note that she is a contrast with some of the Israelites. You see, she's contrasted with this person named Achan. Um, now Achan was a person who was of the Israelites. Rahab was of the Canaanites. Um, Achan uh, stole from some, from something that was supposed to be dedicated to God, and as a result, he was treated he, he he treated God like he wasn't one of his people, and so as a result, he was treated like he wasn't one of the people. Rahab wasn't one of the people, and she was treated as though she were one of the people. Um, Rahab hid hid the uh, hid the 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 spies on her roof. And Achan uh, hid the stolen stuff under his tent, or under his sleeping bag, or not sleeping bag, <laughs> uh, under his uh, under his tent, I believe. Uh, but um, that's just a, a, a few of the examples of how Rahab and 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 and, and uh, Achan are strongly contrasted. Uh, for more on that, there's a book called Grasping God's Word. Uh, by Duvall and Hayes, it was published by Zondervan, just an excellent book, and it talks more about that. It also gives you a really good outline for how to understand the Bible, so I highly recommend you, you look into that. Um, also, uh, in the book of Joshua, we see the Levites and the cities of refuge. Um, cities of refuge being places for people to flee if they've accidentally killed someone. Um, and, and, and the Levites obviously don't get their own areas. They, they, they get certain towns in each of the tribes to live in. Um, yeah. Now, um, we also see the, the idea of passing on the faith throughout the book of Joshua. Uh, in one nine, for instance, it says, Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous, do not tremble or be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Um, and then in 8.30-35, uh, um, it says, Then Joshua built an altar to the Lord, the God of Israel, in Mount Ebal, just as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded the sons of Israel. So I could keep on going, but um, obviously passing on the faith is, is a key um, is a key uh, emphasis of the book of Joshua. Um, in 24:31 it says, uh, Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who survived Joshua and had known all the deeds of the Lord which he had done or done. Um, for Israel, and then the, the Pentateuch constantly says about how they should tell their kids and set up these monuments, um, so that when their kids ask, they can tell them. It goes through all these different things and, and whatnot. Um, now, in Genesis twelve six through seven. Abram passed through the land as far as the site of Shechem to the oak of Morah. Now the Canaanite was then in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who appeared to him. Um, and then you can see how a lot of times places are reaffirmed in the Bible. Pay attention to where things happen in the Bible and, and how that is important and what those names mean and what else happens there in the future. Um, and then uh, the idea of the idea of setting making a holy place of, of passing on you know they built these altars and everything to the Lord to establish the Lord's name. Um, so um, we see the value of obedience and the fulfillment of the law in Joshua. Finally, after all these years, the people are in the land and then they, they had their the inheritance is there, you know, and God has blessed the obedience. Um, so the outline looks somewhat like this. Israel conquers the land in chapters 1 through 12. Israel divides the land in chapters 13 through 21. And Israel begins to settle in the land in chapter 23 to 24. 24. So um, the con conquer the land can be broken up into the different campaigns, the northern, central, and southern campaigns. But um, that's kind of a little bit too persnickety for me. I just like the general outline there. Um, so themes of Joshua. Uh, first off is the transition of power. Moses was the one called to do this, and yet... When Joshua comes up, it says that some of the spirit from Moses was on him, you know. So, so Moses pa passed it on, and, and then Joshua uh, told the people, "Hey, we need to pass this on as well." Um, <clears throat> also, another theme is the conquest and division of the land. Um, God's faithfulness to his, to his promises. That all through all these times, throughout all the different things that have that have you know jeopardized the people 
getting the land that God still caused it to happen. So these are these are the two mountains: Mount Ebal, Mount Gerizim, um, and Shechem's here in the middle. Um, obviously, I just read that in Genesis about Shechem, um, and so Abraham, you know, built an altar there. And when they got into the promised land, Israel half stood over here and half stood over here, and they said the law to each other um, through a series of affirmations or whatever. And it's very interesting because this has been called a, 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 an amphitheater. It's been called a, an echo chamber. Um, so uh, they were, would have been able to hear it on both, excuse me, on both sides, um, just because of the way the voice projects. Um, so. Um, and that, that ties in Abraham, um, where he built the altar with Moses, and what Moses told Joshua to, to, to have the people uh, say, say to each other on Ebal and Gerizim, and then in Joshua, the people actually do. Um, so it's just uh, the, the view from looking from one to the other. And so these are the 12 tribes you've got. Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh, and the Manasseh here as well. Issachar, Zebulon, Asher, and Naphtali. Ephraim, Dan, Benjamin, Judah, Simeon. Um, now, some of these um, kind of move around a little bit, um, but I mean, that's the basic that's the basic structure of how it was once upon a time supposed to be. In fact, if you look right here, Asher, the land of Asher is actually supposed to be in there where Tyre is. Um, which I believe Tyre was never part of um, Israel. Um, so, anyways, uh, and there, it was actually supposed to go all the way up to um, the river there, but you know, obviously it doesn't. So, regarding holy war, first off, the people were exceedingly wicked, as Leviticus 18:24 through 30 mentions. It talks about that um, they did a lot of just backwards things. Um, also, secondly, Genesis 15:13 through 16 shows us that God gave them time much, much time to repent and that they never did. Um, also, Joshua 11, 18 through 20 shows that God used Israel to punish them, okay? Um, because, once again, God is holy and he cannot, he, his holiness demands justice even in light of his love. In fact, I would argue that his love is very much needing of his justice. They're not two different things, they are two overlapping things. Um, <clears throat> so, um, but he later used Assyria and Babylon to punish, this, uh, punish Israel. The only difference being that Israel, um, he, you know, was his people, and he, and he remembered his promise to them. That was really the only difference there. Um, so, well, why didn't God uh, call, make all the people his people? Well, if you remember, that's how it was, and it didn't work out so well. There really was only Adam. If if it wouldn't have worked out with only one man, it wouldn't have worked out with all the men. If it wouldn't have worked out with one nation, it would have worked, wouldn't, wouldn't have worked out with all the nations. And it says that Israel wasn't even that big of a nation. He didn't pick them, Deuteronomy says, because of how great they were, but if, rather because of how small they were. Um, so with that being said, I mean, it's worth noting that um, if, it, if a small nation wouldn't have done it, then a large nation wouldn't have either. Um, so... Um, but, however, holy war was rarely commanded, and this was uh, specifically about um, about the promised land. Um, Amalek, there in 1 Samuel 5, 15, 1-3, was mentioned, um, but that's because, um, that was, once again, because it was related with this. Um, so, uh, holy war was only commanded in this instance here, and God still brings punishment on the wicked people and on wicked nations and whatnot. That is something that God definitely still does do. However, with that being said, I want to come to an understanding here. The There is currently no nation which is in covenant with the Lord, just in case people are, are, are big on this. There is no nation in covenant with the Lord. America was not founded on, on Christian principles, and it is not a Christian nation, and there is nothing for it to return to. Okay, Maybe if you want them to... America to be saved, that's something, but to return, they can't return to something that they've never been. Let's talk about Abraham, or, or America's founding, okay? Slavery, yeah, that's a Christian principle, isn't it? Um, the rum trade, yeah, that, that's real Christian. Rebellion of authority, there, there's another Christian uh, Christian mindset. And, and not because, remember, they didn't rebel because of this or that or this or that. They rebelled against England because of 
money issues. That was it. See what I mean? So once again, remember remember these things. Um, and so what happened is you had a bunch of different Christian groups that, that couldn't get along with each other. And so rather than facing the storm that was England, they all fled to America. Genius. Let's let's partake of isolation isolationistic principles and hope that that uh, that that continues the way of God. Oh wait, it doesn't. See, the thing is, is and those Christians were living in disobedience to the Lord. We cannot possibly say that America was founded on Christian principles. Yeah, it's, uh, the, most of the founding fathers weren't even Christians per se, as deists. They believed in God for to a certain degree and to certain extents, but none of them really believed. Well, not none of them, but many of them didn't believe in, in real solid principles there. Many of them believed that, believed that um, in, in a Unitarian faith. Many of them, uh, for instance, Thomas Jefferson, uh, you know, had his own version of the Bible that he, he did, and it had all kinds of stuff taken out. I mean, you could go down the list of stuff. Um, these the, these were not these were not righteous people. They were just. Christians who were running to, some of them were Christians, some of them weren't, who were trying to run away from persecution. That's there's nothing right about that. Also, um, there is no nation that is currently in in um, covenant with the Lord. The nation of Israel that no longer really applies. The people of Israel have not been forgotten. But they are in a time of, of, you know, Paul talks about that. But God will still preserve 12,000 from each tribe um, for the end, the 144,000. Um, so, you know, that obviously touches on Revelation, but still God will not forget his people. Uh, however, the nation itself is not in covenant with the Lord. Um, and it's important to note that we should not stand behind Israel just because they have, there are Israelites in it. Okay? Um, the Jewish people may not have been forgotten by God, but however, the nation itself, I mean, we cannot condone immorality. Now, once again, we shouldn't condone war either. That's, that's kind of a, kind of, kind of would be in a dumb, dumb uh, middle way mark there. But just remember that sometimes in America we get the idea that being American is being Christian, and sometimes we have the idea that, you know, we have to do all this nationalistic, patriotic stuff to be saved, and it's not like that. Love the Jew, don't hate, don't don't love the nation. Let's just be like that. Um, which once again, I'm not saying you have to be anti-Israel. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm just saying sometimes bias is, is taught, and we just cling on to that bias for all it's worth, and we just let a lot of things go. Um, but God still does bring judgment. Now I'm not saying that every time that there's a flood in freaking Louisiana. That that means that it's something from God. I'm not saying that at all. Okay, don't don't even say that I said that. I did not say that. Um, sometimes bad things happen. Sometimes God allows some things to happen. Sometimes God causes some things to happen. With that being said, I think that I've beaten that one enough. Now, going on to Judges. Judges happens from about 1300 to 1050, or potentially later. Once again, it depends on when you date the Exodus. Um, and so it really just depends on how much time, because either way it ended about 1050 or so. Um, there are overlap of the judges, I mentioned that, and, and the judges only served in specific regions. Um, so, uh, judges shows a failure, the lack of faith, uh, I'm sorry, a, a failure to conquer the land. And the reason why it mentions is twofold. First off, they failed to conquer the land totally because they had a lack of faith in God, and two, because they didn't persevere. I'm sorry. And three, um, there was uh, they they, dis they disobeyed God. They they didn't follow God's ways. Sorry, because of three reasons. So um, they didn't believe. They didn't trust in God. God for that for for Him to give them the land fully. They didn't persevere in that faith and continue in it. And they and they disobeyed God and didn't live His way. So about 1200, there was a shifting. Um, Egypt and, and the Hittites kind of pull, started pulling out of of Canaan before Egypt had had control over Canaan, and um, that really just started to, they, they they lost the land. They pulled out. The Philistines came in and with them brought iron, and the land excuse me the land became harder to conquer. If the, if the Israelites would have done it when they were supposed to, it would have been a lot easier, and they probably would have been able to prevent the Philistines from coming. But because of because of that, the Philistines were able to get in there and get rooted in, and brought iron with them, which was a lot harder of a metal, was a lot 
better of metal. Um, also, another thing that we see is that the Holy Spirit comes on individuals in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, the 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 Church Age, you know, the Holy Spirit comes on comes on you know uh, whoever as He wills. But on this, it comes on specific people for specific times. Um, um, and then Judges shows us the effects of disobeying God's law. All throughout the book, it says that people did what was right in their own eyes. And it also talks repeatedly about um, the people's lack of, of, of identity, that they didn't have a king, that they didn't have a king, that they didn't have a king. And so then in 1 Samuel picks up with, hey, we want a king. you know. Um, so anyways, um, so it picks up there in the beginning with the incomplete conquest going from 1-1 all the way to the 2-5. And then it has the covenant disobedience and judgment um, in 2.6 to 16.31, which follows a format like this. Sin, they sin. There's war, and they're defeated. There's repentance, which then causes God to raise up a judge, and they're delivered. And they just keep repeating this over and over again. Um, and what we see is in chapter 17 through 21, the collapse of society. And, and then eventually... <clears throat> <clears throat> which is kind of based on two different things. First off, um, there's there's a religious and civil breakdown. Which I'm sorry, there's a, a civil breakdown, and then there's a religious breakdown. So there's kind of a twofold approach of what's going on that leads to the collapse of the society. So this leads to anarchy and relativism. People did whatever was right in their own eyes. Anarchy because they didn't have anyone over their heads. They just did whatever they thought was best. So it has this this twofold religious and civil breakdown. Um, which, which causes the collapse of society, which once again is is a cautionary tell um, to any nation afterwards that, that whenever you have a religious and civil breakdown, especially at the same time, um, there is going to be a collapse of society, which never ends well. Um, with the collapse of society means a weaker government um, and a weaker people because they're undefined and they're unsure of themselves. With weaker people comes easiness to conquer. Um, so man decides right and wrong in 19, 1 through 30. And if you if you if you read that, um, it, it it doesn't say like Sodom and Gomorrah, but it gives it lets you draw your own conclusions. In Joshua 19, 1 through 30, the people act exactly like they did in, in in the account of Sodom and Gomorrah. If you read through Genesis 9, 1 through 11, you see that he's definitely referencing Sodom and Gomorrah without saying this is bad, just saying that people did it, it was right in his own eyes. So what? How is Joshua? Te how, I'm sorry, Judges. How is Judges teaching us something? It's teaching us something by indirect reference. It's teaching us something by showing the example rather than telling us is this right and wrong, right or wrong. Um, so w this this book, you know, was written. It God knows when it was written, but this is when the, the events happened around 1300. Um, to about 1050, but it was written probably by, you know, different, I mean, actually, there is no probably, there, we have no idea who it was written by. Um, it could have been, you know, Samuel or his or his disciples, it could have been, um, you know, Elijah or Elisha, it could have been Jeremiah, I mean, you go down the list of people who it could have been, but ultimately we don't know. And so a lot of these books, I've just kind of skipped talking about that. Um, so this is another map. I believe this. Oops, I believe that this was a map which was done for the ESV Bible, but I'm not positive. Um, and, and like I say, I, 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 I'm really not. It happened a long time ago where I got these pictures, and so I don't remember um, where I got them from. So I can't really elaborate too much on them. But basically, you see Philistia over here to the side here against the coast. Tyre up here. Bashan up here, you see that just the, the, the different people where, where the different judges were Jephthah, Jer, uh, Barak, Shamgar, Ellen, Gideon, Tola, uh, Abdon, Samson, Ibsen, Othniel, Ehud, and Deborah. Uh, and just uh, you can see how, how the people just kind of have this breakdown and they're living among other people as well. Um, and so the people really aren't that unique anymore. And you can see Dan up here and uh, Beersheba down here, northernmost to southernmost. So. Um, um, so that takes us to the book of Ruth. Um, I, I really hope I explained all that well enough. Um, uh, but anyways, going back to the author thing, um, I, I normally won't mention the authors unless, you know, it, it seems pretty clear or it kind of more matters. I may, I may say tradition and that kind of stuff, but, um... 
I mean, a lot of times it's not that important, and all that you really need to know is when the events happened. Now, if you would like to know more on theories of who wrote it and when it was written and that kind of stuff, I would highly recommend picking up a survey, an Old Testament survey book, which will talk about that kind of stuff. Um, if you don't like the Encountering Biblical Studies, um, there are other ones out there. Just make sure that it's, you know, um, a good Christian author. So, Ruth starts, and Ruth is a very short book, but it has a lot of interesting things. Uh, first off, it happened during the times of the judges, as 1-1 one, one shows us. Second off, second off, it has people who are outcasts of society. Moabite, I mean a, a, a Moabite, a woman Moabite, and a widow woman Moabite. So you have literally the bottom of the, of the chain. Okay, like literally the 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 answer ping on her, and um, you know then you have. But the interesting thing is is the person who's actually the central figure of Ruth is not Ruth. It's actually Naomi. The book starts and ends with Naomi. Um, it's set up very much like a play. Um, in two two it talks about the law of gleaning. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, Please let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after one in whose sight I may find favor. And she said to her, Go, my daughter. Now in the law, you had you couldn't pick up everything from your from your from your crop. You had to leave some for the people. <laughs> for the poor people and whatnot. Um, yeah, for the poor people. Um, now in, in chapter three, though there's been a lot of speculation in verses six to thirteen. So she went down to the threshing floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law had commanded her. When Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain, and she came secretly and then covered his feet and lay down. Now, it goes on, but um, a lot of people have said that there was some sexual promiscuity going on. One of the points of Ruth is that the people kept uh, – acted with integrity and that uh, God worked it for, for the good. So – I lean against that understanding because that would kind of contradict one of Ruth's the whole one of the main points of Ruth. So I don't know, um, but it seems like this. Um, so at the threshing floor, they would they would sit by their by their by by their by their wheat um, and sleep with it so that nobody would nobody would take it during the night. Um, so it seems like that that's what he's doing. He's happy. He's doing that. You know, got gets drunk and all this. Um, and then that she just simply uh, asked for his was asking for his hand in marriage. That's all it really seems to imply that she could have gone to a younger man or whatever, but that she went to him. So obviously implying that he's not that young, um, and uh, wanting him uh, to marry instead. Um, and, and it seems like that's all it is, just simply simply asking for for marriage. Um, I wouldn't push it much farther than that. Um, unless you had some substantial proof. Um, so then comes the idea of a kinsman redeemer. So the Israelites had this idea, which obviously came from God and the law, that God was the owner of everything and it really wasn't theirs. It was basically they were stewards over it, if you will. Um, and so your family would, would, would have a certain plot of land or whatever, and you could lease it to somebody or, or, or it was basically selling, but at the end of that time it would go back to your family. Um, unless um, there was no one left in your family, in which case um, it would it would you know it could be sold like that. Um, so a kinsman redeemer would, was someone who would restore the land to the owner. They would be a f uh, the next closest relative to the person who had sold their sold their property, and they could uh, buy it back for the person. Um, so in 4, 1 through 11, it's talking about the kinsman redeemer and how uh, Boaz is a kinsman redeemer. But there's one who's closer. And basically what that means is that the closer, rel closest relative gets first dibs and it goes out like that. Um, so uh, if if he had if this other guy had bought in, uh, it, in chapter 4, it talks about uh, Boaz goes to him and says, do you want to buy Naomi, uh, Naomi's field or whatever? Uh, and and uh, he says, yes, I would love to do that. Now, at this point, it is just an investment. He has to take care of, care of and she has to take care of Naomi for for a few years, um, and then the land would just become part of his land. It would be an investment. You'd be earning something. But then, um, with Ruth coming into the addition later on, it says, um, 
um, that, that Boaz says, okay, it also comes with Ruth. And he says, oh, well, then I can't take that. The reason why is because then he would be subject to uh, Levirate ma marriage. I can't say that word, so don't make fun of me. Um, which basically meant that he would have to um, marry Ruth and provide her a child. In which case, his land would be further divided first off. So he would have had to... Had to give off some of his some of his inheritance that he had accumulated to this child that wasn't even his okay then next or I'm, well, yeah it wasn't really his because when with, with the Levi marriage when you had a child for someone else it was literally um that per, in, done in the father's name so so it wouldn't have been your name attached it would have been that guy's name um, but then also he would have had to provide for Ruth and Naomi and he probably wasn't that rich that he could provide for that um, and so he was probably thinking, nope, I'm out. Um, and so the heirs then would 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 uh, his heirs would um, would be robbed of, of their full investment or of his investment. Um, so that's that's what happens there. Now, as far as a sandal issue, it seems that taking off your sandal was just saying a, a sign of, of you're giving up the right to walk the land. That's basically what it seems to imply. I know a lot of people have come up with a lot of ideas. But this one seems to be more of grounded in probability. Um, you know, different part, passages of the scripture say about walking the land and different stuff. And it seems like that is definitely what he's talking about um, uh, here in this. Um, so that with that, uh, that takes us to the outline of Ruth. Um, so first off, the famine drives Naomi to Moab in 1, 1 through 5. Uh, the family dies, and Ruth follows her back in, ver in, in verses 6 through 22. Ruth cleans in Boaz's field in chapter 2. Ruth's request to Boaz in chapter 3. Ruth marries Bo Boaz in 4, 1 through 15. And God's faithfulness and blessing in, in 16 through 22 of chapter 4. Um, and then no Naomi lifted from her lowly state in, in 4, 13 through 22. And I'll, and I'll read that because that is the end of this section. Um, it says this. Uh, so Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife, and he went into her, and the, which is 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 the Bible's way of saying that they had sex. Um, and she became his wife. And, okay. And the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. Then the woman said to Naomi, "Blessed is the Lord who has not left you without a redeemer today." Sorry, the women said to Naomi, "May also may he also be to to you a restore excuse me a restorer of life." And a sustainer of your old age, for your daughter-in-law, who loves you and is better to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. Um, so then that takes us to uh, verse 16. Then Naomi took the child and laid him in her lap and became his nurse. The neighbor woman gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. So they named him Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now, are there, now these are the generations of Perez. And it goes on with that. So to show that, you know, David was, was um, once again, going back to the offspring of David, who would be in Jesus' genealogy. Um, so once again, the story ends with Naomi being lifted up. In other words, she is the key victor, uh, key uh, um, character in, in all this. Um, so with that, we finish up this section. Next lesson will be on the law from promise to covenant. Actually, I should have said from... Uh, no, I said that right. From promise to covenant to law. Um, God gave Abram a promise, then he gave him a covenant, then he gave Moses a law. So, um, with that, we are done. As always, leave any questions uh, down below, and I will get to them as soon as I can. Um, I hope that I've made this uh, less confusing. Um, if I have, go back and just pause the video and read the PowerPoints and see what I said there, and then listen to what I said again. And if it's still kind of confusing, and I've at, you've asked me and I've explained or, or, or as to as much as I could, um, then read a survey of, of the Old Testament and kind of see if that helps. If that doesn't help, read a commentary or, or I don't know, um, ask some ask a professor of a university uh, if you know any Christian uh, professors that would work. Uh, but just. Uh, don't give up. Just keep uh, keep seeking, and you'll get through the fog of understanding scripture.